So we're going to get started with a little practice. I mean, nice work, everybody. You made it here. It's Saturday. It's foggy. I don't know about you, but like my cats were like, you're doing what? Like you're leaving right now? Like we could just cuddle. So really appreciate you making it here. And we're going to take a couple moments to settle in and just do a grounding practice. This won't be a long practice. Just wanted to help us kind of have a little bit of that transition from whatever came before to fully arriving here. So this is a space that is familiar for some, but not familiar for others. So I really invite you to take care of yourself and your body in terms of what works as a posture for this practice. We have Cage at the door who is being uh, supportive of us so that we can deepen our sense of being held here. So I invite you if it's comfortable to close your eyes, otherwise they can be softly open in front of you. And notice that transition of closing the eyes and bringing the attention inward. So much information comes from our visual perception, sense door of perception and seeing. And so when we close the eyes, we're invited to start feeling the sensations in the body. They were there before we closed the eyes, but now we have a real opportunity to bring a full sense of focus just to the array and cascade of sensory experiences in the body. I invite you to feel a sense of the substantiality of the body the matter of the body. And as we feel this substantiality of the body, we sense at the exact same time that we are being supported in the body, held up from beneath. Feel a sense of your feet, or if you're sitting on the ground, your legs being supported beneath you. You might even want to wiggle the toes a bit and really turn on the experience of sensing the ground beneath you. Noticing the posture. For those of us who are sitting upright, this posture is a beautiful metaphor for our practice. A sense of being grounded and connected. A softness through the front of the body. And the dignity and uprightness of our spine. to help us connect with our posture and further settle the mind. As we inhale, feel and sense the sense of the upright spine, sense of vividness, brightness. And through our exhales now, inviting a sense of ease and relaxation, softening and melting through the front of the body. So inhaling this vividness, this upright wakefulness, exhaling ease, relaxation.
taking a moment to really invite a full sense of attention and awareness through the breath. As though the only thing that your mind had to do was follow the course of breath through the inhale and exhale. As though the most important thing you could do today and in your entire lifetime is develop this close and kind attention to the breath. See if you can notice and feel the breath from within the body. So not as though we are observing the breath from our mind, looking down into the body, but feel the body breathing us. And of course, there's thoughts and memories and images. For those in the space, we may be distracted by, by sounds outside. But as we start to settle more into the body, into the breath, we may find a sense of openness in the heart and spaciousness in the mind. For a couple more moments here, feel the whole body breathing. Such a simple practice, attending to the breath, and yet so challenging. We can see so clearly how the mind has such force pulling us away time and time again to thoughts and memories, images. But this simple practice of coming back to the breath again and again is a foundation of emotion awareness knowing when our mind has been carried away by a thought or feeling. So a couple more moments here of getting our engine started, this practice of observing, returning, relaxing. And we'll take a moment here now that we've settled a bit, our body, speech, and mind, and consider our intention for coming here today, specifically as related to these emotions of anger and sadness. <clears throat> Considering an intention that's personal, what are the ways we'd like to understand and 
unfold more around these emotions. How could we hold these emotions in ways that's more beneficial for us? What are the ways that we could be more skillful and wholesome in our engagement with these states? And considering our intention of how we would like our work with these emotions to benefit others. How can our holding of anger and needing of sadness benefit the beings close to us and benefit beings yet unknown to us? allowing this intention to really feel like a guiding light, an inner lantern. And allowing the intention now to recede a bit into the background, not to disappear, but to just no longer be foreground. And we'll bring this opening practice to a close with three longer inhales and exhales, seeing if when we inhale, we can invite the belly to travel back towards the spine. And as we exhale, expanding the belly out gently, twice more, lengthening the inhale and drawing the belly button in. And exhale, expanding. And one more time on the rhythm of your own breath. Thank you for your practice. So before we get into our first introduction to these emotions and working with them, I want to remind us of something that's incredibly valuable, precious, and deserves a lot of our kind attention, which is that we are practicing in community today. How wonderful it truly makes this practice a lot richer and deeper to be reflecting on our emotions and the qualities of our heart together. And in doing so, it's important for us to keep in mind, yeah, the, the delicate and tender nature of being with other beings, especially talking about our emotions. So in the context of the Dharma Collective, it's a real aspiration and goal for us that folks feel a sense of ease here. They feel a sense as much as possible of safety. And in order to ensure that, we really invite us to treat the entire time we are here together as practice. So it's not as though we're compassionate when we're meditating and mindful, and then we are just back in the world and normal 
we really want to bring that conscientiousness throughout our time together. We'll have two opportunities today to work in smaller groups together. And in doing so, it's, again, kind of incomparably useful and also risky, right? Like other people, my gosh, other people you don't know, other people you do know, all of it can have its own challenges. And what I'm inviting us all here to consider is when we are with one another, to treat one another as the Buddha and treat one another as divine beings, to really see the goodness in one another. And as we do so, we both can respect and understand just such a variety of lived experiences. We may think we know something about someone because of this outer shell. Obviously, it's just a sliver of who they are. And when we have that sense of that respect of the inner goodness to another being, also, we are relieved of trying to fix it for them, trying to make it better for them right? No need. They're already perfect, right? So I, I really invite us, like folks who come, especially to do emotion work, many of us in this room are professional or default healers. Am I right? Who here heals other people in their life kind of, you know, a lot, or at least some of the time? Okay. So in this context today, you can take all that energy towards yourself. No need to imagine and offer that to others. And that allows each of us to show up um, as we want to be and, and not feel as though we're going to be corrected or fixed in some way. How does that sound to people? Can we get into that? We are compassionate comrades all together. Great. And, you know, for the folks online, um, that's also, you know, just as true being in your own space, uh, can actually be, feel like kind of cozy and tucked in and you can feel some more openness, but also you lack some of these embodied cues of being to see and know people. So just really taking care of that sense of welcoming openness as though it really were a kind of deep curiosity to what the other person is sharing. Um, as opposed to uh, analyzing and trying to uh, get into it. Uh, for folks who are not interested in doing small group, no problem at all. I'll give you option for journaling instead, both in person and online. So that's our, that's our kind of community uh, agreed upon um, container here. Is there anything else I didn't mention that's important for folks that would help them feel like they can really show up here and um, be respected and seen by others? All right. And uh, as always here at the Dharma Collective, if at the end of our time today, you think of a way, like you're like, man, you know what would have really helped me if we specifically name this, that or the other? please let us know. It's an ongoing work in progress here to create this space for us to connect and be together. So we're going to move now a little bit, and I'm going to give you just a tiny bit of background on where the, the origin of the teachings that we're going to connect with today are coming from. So cultivating emotional balance is a 42 hour course. We're here for three hours. So think of it as like the condensed bullion cube of, um, of this course. And this 42 hour course really weaves together uh, traditional contemplative wisdom, essentially coming from a secularized version of Tibetan Buddhism. The originator of the curriculum of this course is named Alan Wallace. He's a pretty well-known teacher, author. He has authored 42 books. I just always have to say that because it I am in awe. Uh, he's currently in long-term retreat, but has taught all over the world. And his really, you know, deep interest is in bringing a specific and rich understanding of contemplative practices. So in cultivating emotional balance, for example, there are nine different phases and stages of mindfulness of breathing. I sprinkled three into ours, but <clears throat> it's really wonderful to get that kind of um, nuance in, in the training, as we will focus on today, are these four heart practices, the four Brahma Viharas. These are, of course, not unique to cultivating emotional balance. They are across almost every tradition in Buddhism. But you'll see that there's differences in how these practices are taught. And the ones that we are teaching today are definitely coming from the Tibetan lineage. 
on the other side of the kind of wisdom stream in this teaching is coming from the science of emotion. And so this is not necessarily the psychotherapeutic approach to emotion. It's what have we discovered in the neuroscience and the laboratory and the exploration through social psychology, cognitive psychology of emotion in the last 40 or so years. And the originator of this curriculum was my dear dad, who might join us online at some point today uh, with, with camera off. So he's welcome to take a nap if it gets boring for him. Um, but he is, uh, he is an amazing emotion researcher. He's an amazing dad. He's an accomplished emotion researcher and was the originator in the field of really looking at the physiology of emotion facial expression, embodied experience. And then in 2000, he got this chance to meet Alan Wallace, the Dalai Lama, and a handful of other uh, scientists all on the topic of destructive emotions. And I just wanna take a moment here. Destructive emotions is not meaning negative or bad emotions, not like anger and sad are bad and destructive and happiness is good, but more the emotions that we enact in a way that is harmful to ourselves and others. This harm could be really subtle and this harm could be really profound. A really a subtle example that I love of a destructive emotion is not that I love, but that I am familiar with is being passive aggressive. Who knows that one? <laughs> yeah, we have one honest person in the room. Um, <laughs> but that kind of like trying to not show you're angry when you're angry and it's actually, and you think you're like being really good because you're not showing how angry you actually are. but obviously you're fooling no one and it totally makes other people feel uncomfortable. If not also angry is contagious. And that's kind of like a subtle destructive emotion, a more explicit destructive emotion, especially when we think about anger is aggression and violence, right? Anger in and of itself is actually not a problem. And we'll get more into that. But when we think about destructive emotions, we're really thinking about how do we support our ability to choose more wisely and skillfully how we respond to our emotions. And so in this meeting with the Dalai Lama and Alan and my dad, Richie Davidson, Daniel Goldman, like all these awesome superstars that I uh, have really felt I grew up with and rest on the shoulders of in terms of my own research and work, they really were determined to find a way to bring these wisdom traditions together. Like, how do we bring what we know from science, which science is good at like picking things apart, right? Like putting the little bug in the, in the glass case and naming it and looking at the other genus of bugs just like it. We're gonna really examine the anatomy of emotion from what we've discovered in all these research and experiments. But also with this wisdom tradition that helps us bring more awareness, bring more care, and be able to work with our emotions and sometimes the difficult ways that they show up in our lives with ourselves and with others. So they developed this curriculum in 2000 and 2005, they started researching it and their first group was working with school teachers. And it's primarily been a training that's meant for educational purposes to help reduce stress, improve positive affect, make people feel more connected. In some of the early research studies, they found it improved people's disagreements. Uh, so couples who got together after CEB, they actually liked each other more. They could argue more effectively. So that's obviously a great selling point. We all could use a little bit of that. And in um, 2010 was the first teacher training and I was really honored to be the co-teacher with Alan and I've been teaching it since then. And it's um, a really beautiful way in the hours we have together to just start examining some of the tenets of this training programs, looking at an emotion episode timeline, which is kind of one of our main methods and tools of doing that kind of anatomy and dissection of our emotions so we can understand them more clearly, and then applying these heart practices and the heart practices of compassion, loving kindness, empathetic joy, and equanimity these are often considered antidotes to our destructive emotions as though the only reason they don't like that word is because I don't think emotions are poison. I don't think we need an antidote, but they are ways to ameliorate, to help us transform the difficult ways our emotions can show up. So today our, our goal is to kind of use this space and time together as a little laboratory. Like how can we investigate together these ideas about emotions and practices so that this afternoon we can apply them. 
So that's the real goal and, and hope here. Um, before I get into the next steps, just a little bit of, of housekeeping here. There is a bathroom in the back with tea and water. We're not going to take like official breaks. So you can go and get water, uh, get uh, use the restroom. But I ask that uh, you don't do so in our meditation time. That'd be helpful. And as much as possible, like do stay in this room so that we can stay connected. Okay. So I'd love to start with a question for you all. What's an emotion? Energy and motion in motion, energy in motion. Anybody else? Um, some neuro, neurobiological thing that occurs when I'm stimulated by something. Neurobiological thing <laughs> that occurs when I'm stimulated by something. I like that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm just guessing that maybe to me it feels like a physical reaction to a thought I may or may not know I'm having. Mm, a physical reaction to a thought I may or may not know I'm having. Awesome. Anybody else? Sometimes I think it's a message from some other place. Mm. Meaning it's drawing towards or away from something. Mm. Interesting. A message from another place drawing you towards or away from something. Yeah. I'm thinking it's kind of a somewhere between a sensation and a mental thing that it is um that it is like an articulation of a sensation mm. in the body mm -hmm. articulation of sensation in the body that's great is there any thoughts with it are there any feelings yeah um Yeah, well, this is something I want to know more about because I'm unclear. I, I right, but I, I feel that it is it that I, I am not sure if the thoughts come from the emotion or the emotion comes from the thoughts. <laughs> this is like the bajillion dollar question. Yes. Do thoughts come from emotions or emotions come from thoughts? But I think it starts with the sensation. But it starts with the sensation. So this, I'll just say, this is a ongoing area of debate across psychology. I'm going to present mostly one side of that debate. And if you want to debate that, we can do that later. Um, and the reason I present this one side is I find it to be the most useful for emotion awareness. A lot of the debate is truly academic. It has to do with something that I love about emotion and emotion research, which is we actually can't measure it that well. We can measure certain parts. We can measure if your face is expressing something. We can measure, we can measure gastric constriction in your belly when you feel disgust or anger. <clears throat> we can measure the temperature on your face, this kind of different way that um, blood rushes to your face when you feel different things. We can measure autonomic nervous system arousal very blunt measure. High, low could mean so many things. In the, in the functional magnetic resonance imaging and the scanner, we actually can't measure emotion that well because emotions are so fast. So emotions are triggered in a 25th of a second, which is so conceptual. Like I have no idea how long that is, right? What is like, but very, very fast, right? And emotions generally, when we're talking about the physiology of our emotion, they're, how long do you think there are? Anybody? Like how long are emotions? You think 90 seconds? Anybody else? How long? Depends on the emotion. Depends on the emotion. Anybody else? 15 seconds? Max seven. Seven seconds or seven minutes? In that spectrum. Yeah. They're, they're about 30 to 90 seconds in our emotions. But what we see is that we just like string them together, right? Right back to back to back to back. So our emotions actually include three main components, a trigger, 
an experience and a response. And we're going to work with that, those three phases. That's really a great way for us to understand our emotion. So when we're describing the experience in the body, that's the middle part of that timeline of emotion. So the sensations that are happening in the body is one part of the state of our emotion. The trigger, right? Could it be a thought? Uh, could it be an event in the world? You know, I had an awesome triggering event this morning, which was my printer not working. Um, and that was that wasn't just like thinking about my printer not working. That was legit my printer not working, right? So it can be a thought. And right now I could re-trigger myself to frustration if I thought about my printer not working. And the interesting thing about our emotions is so my printer didn't work, I felt frustrated, but then, you know, I texted my friends Noma and Cage and I was like, hey, my printer's not working, right? I, I took a response that was constructive but I could have cycled through that emotion so many times. I could have thought like capitalism, why do we build these things that break? This is a, this is a plan. This is to make us have to buy more things and make more track. I could have just cycled out. Right. So one emotion experience that's 30 to 90 seconds can become minutes, hours, and we can even lengthen it, right? And come back to it, especially our strong emotions. We come back to over and over. A couple of weeks ago in our Wednesday night um, group, we were talking about kind of our grievance that we have towards other people when we're holding the sense of frustration towards others. And we can let that be part of our mind state for weeks and months, right? If you have that <clears throat> difficult family member, coworker, manager, like you can just cycle through emotions with that. But when we look at the question now, should I save it for later about the printer? <laughs> <laughs> just one moment. Yeah. Let me get through a little bit more um, description. So I might answer it hopefully. Um, so yeah. So emotions are very brief. They have these three stages of the trigger, the experience, the response. And then we can also kind of keep re-triggering our emotion over and over. Um, what I think is interesting about emotions is that we're only emotional in response to something important to us. And what's important to us is actually unique. So, <clears throat> for example, this water bottle probably does not trigger an emotion for anybody here, right? Probably not a big deal. But when I was at work the other day, I saw someone who had this water bottle. And it was exciting to me because I, I didn't have it, this one there at that day, but I took this backpacking last year and I had just one of the most amazing trips I've ever had in the back country, like clear lakes, beautiful skies. And so when I saw this water bottle, I was triggered to an emotion of joy because I have a personal relationship with, with this, right? Nobody else in that room saw the water bottle and was like blissing out, right? And so what's specific about emotions is actually our unique lived history. And so for us to really start understanding emotions, it's not just this big title emotions. They are this, they're not that, they're this other thing. It's understanding our personal and unique history, what we call a database of our emotions. And this is not news. We all know this, right? Our lived experiences of everything that has happened to us, potentially intergenerationally, potentially longer, it's like it's hanging out in the way that we interact and engage with the world. And it's the way we experience per perceiving the world around us. So in Buddhism, we talk about how can we more, how can we get closer to seeing things as they are? Right? We try to strip away all of our judgment, strip away the projections that we put so that we could experience just what is seen, what is felt, what is heard, and really start connecting to this greater sense of spacious awareness. But a lot of what happens is an immediate judgment. So for those of us in the room, there was like some really loud noise the first five minutes or so of our meditation, right? And it was very hard to just receive this noise as noise. It was very easy for the mind to quickly judge and become like, really, on a Saturday morning, they're going to have this noise. Don't they know we're meditating? Right. So we can create this additional content onto anything. And a lot of that additional content is emotion. And so in, it was so interesting in this 2000 meeting with the Dalai Lama is 
he was so excited by this scientific definition of emotion. There's actually not a word for emotion in Buddhism. There are mental states, there are kind of kleshas, there are these like kind of sensory experiences that we get attached to, and also these ways of seeing the world that are ongoing. So if we feel a sense of real aversion, that's not 30 to 90 seconds. Usually that's an ongoing way we're experiencing the world. So it's like, I, I don't like, um, trying to think of a good one. It would be like an ongoing aversion. <clears throat> I don't like the way I look, but I just don't like it. You know, whenever I look in the mirror, I, I don't like it. I'm strong aversion, right? It's kind of this ongoing mindset as opposed to a temporary emotion coming and going. And the distinction matters in that with our momentary emotions, it's like we can follow this little crumb trail to start understanding, like, what is it? Like, why don't I like the way I look? Hmm. Well, if I take just one episode of looking in the mirror, like, how does it start? How does it feel in my body? How do I respond to that? And then I look at the stories and I look at the senses and I look at the responses and just, you know, helpful right? It's like a very structured journal. And then we can apply practices like meditation that help us start to investigate the senses in the body that apply things like compassion or kindness to some of those more difficult material that we have. Okay. I'm about to move into anger specifically. Do, do you still have a question? I am getting a little bit more confused, so I can ask it and you could say if it's already sure. answered. You said that this morning the printer wasn't working, but it wasn't really a thought. It was just a fact. The printer wasn't exactly. Working. But I keep thinking there's a thought the printer should be working. Mm. That would be the first thing. Another thing would be, if I don't bring printing material to this class, people might think I'm not prepared. Of course. To me, I can't see an event called the printer's not working without a thought that makes it wrong. And the example I have is that yesterday I was in San Francisco airport stuck behind a security. Can I just stop or have this mic when it's a little longer? So the, oh, sorry. Can hear? So this is the question yeah. it has to yeah. go with. Is there a stop? Yeah. So I'm behind um, a, a security line at the airport that stops working. And I'm standing at the other side of the conveyor belt waiting for my stuff with the other guy whose backpack is in the camera right now. And I ask him, wow, what do you think they're looking at as more and more security guards are coming over? To which he responds, it's a bear's head. And I said, oh, are you joking? What? And it really, he goes, well, no, it's okay. It's frozen. So this is moment where I'm behind a frozen bear's head. If I was in a different mood, I would think this is horrible. I'm late. I should be out of here. He's crazy. This shouldn't have happened. But in that mood, same event. I'm just like, well, this is so fun. And I just wanted to see what was going to happen. So there could be a time the printer breaks where it doesn't make you contract it because yep. you're in a different state. And I'm wondering if you can address this because to me, it's always that there's a certain state that somehow creates a thought that goes that way instead of that yes. way. What's that about? We're about to get there. Cool. So good. And the bear's head. Wow. Um, did, did folks get the bear's head? It's frozen here. So no problem. <laughs> did folks get the handout already? Or is there some? Oh, cool. Well, we'll hand that out for just a moment. Don't get distracted. Yeah. It's two pages. Yeah. I just want to point out that there's one of the and um well i i can take some questions from the chat if there's any right now uh don't have any at this point Okay, great. So we're going to, the question here though, really is getting to the nature of essentially what you're describing is perception, right? And, and perception is a way of seeing and thinking, but it's not thought in the way when with emotion, I can think about this episode, like you could think about the bare head right now and trigger an emotion. I could think about the pr printer and trigger it, but that's part of the event. You know, what is triggering the emotion? The perception is how we perceive the event itself. And there's always, we're always automatically appraising. Sometimes truly, I would say, I wouldn't say just truly exceptional practitioners because I myself have experienced this. We can have moments and maybe even full meditation practices where we are just experiencing things as they are. But almost always we are 
filtering what we see, feel, hear, think, touch through our perception. And we can experience and be triggered to emotion through any of our sense portals. You know, like we have that smell, like the other day I left the office and there was a smell, it was like that strange day when it rained on Monday. And there was just this specific smell and it reminded me of being in PE as a kid, right? And that was like, wow. And there was an emotion. Um, I liked PE. I know that's not a popular um, <laughs> response to physical ed, but we got to be outside and that was great. And so it's just this interesting way that we can have emotions from what we see, from what we hear, from what we smell, from what we touch. They're really coming to us. And emotions, unless we are really intentionally choosing them, usually come without our conscious um, like we aren't usually aware of our emotions as they are arising within us, right? It's, it's something that is happening through our sense portals. Now, if we choose to watch a horror movie or listen to our favorite sad song, then we're inviting in certain emotions, but largely our emotions are kind of happening to us, right? Through the way that we experience the world. And I don't want to give emotions a bad rap here. They're so helpful, these are not things we want to get rid of. Life would be unsafe and extremely boring. We need our emotions to filter. And you know, someone said like a, a signal of what matters, a signal of what we need to move towards or away from. Our emotions are helping us filter uh, what in our world matters to us and how we want to respond faster than we have time to think. That's the difference between thought and appraisal. So our appraisal is automatic. Whereas our thoughts actually are a little slower. So evolutionary psychologists, folks who try to understand how we ended up with these minds and these bodies right now, they have a theory that emotions arose because they efficiently bundle together, thinking, seeing, feeling, and responding so fast that we can escape from threats in our environment. So our emotions operate outside of our conscious awareness. It explains a lot. Right. If we could choose when we got angry or sad or happy, oh, man, that would be a very different story for most of us. Right. Yeah. Noam and then Jimmy. Yeah. Do you want me to send off the PDF? That would be so great. <clears throat> yeah. So real quick with perception is based on your current mindset or what you're bringing in, what you've already got set up before you have the event trigger. Yep. And then depending on on the way your mind is set, that's gonna depend on whether or not the the bear's head is a pain in the ass yep. going through the airport or whether it's just like, yeah, oh, right. shit, it's a bear's head. And that, and she's describing what's interesting is we can have something that impacts our emotion that's very contextual right now. Like I'm tired, I'm hungry, I'm late. Mm -hmm. That will shift how we respond to whatever arises in our environment. Right. Yeah. But also there's the deeper layers of like, you know, I really don't appreciate the harm of animals. Like I think it's it's un, um, unethical and, you know, savage or brutal to have a bear's head. If that is her point of view, then the emotion is also going to be quite different. But if she's a hunter and she's like, damn, he got a bear, right? Very different. Like, so it's our, our unique history in terms of beliefs, experiences, stories, but also the context of what's happening around us. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I was curious if Renee to the Prince and maybe what you said about it. Yeah. Um, how, if it is a, if it, like, the belief that, like, oh, consumerism like things are not built to last yes ethical yep how do you hold that belief and not get into the cycle like because yeah <laughs> the wonderful question which is how do we work with this these appraisals this database that we're holding all of these um prior experiences in um, my dad, you know, a lot of this is theoretical. Like, like I mentioned, one of the things I love about emotion is that we can't measure it well, which means that we are the experts of our emotions. Mm -hmm. Like no one else, even if you're in a scanner with every single thing hooked up to your body, your galvanic string response, your gastric, all the like electrodermal, your EEG, you have all of those on and you're just thinking about 
something that matters to you, a loved one who you've lost, you know, an opportunity in your future, there is no scanner that can tell you why you're thinking that and what emotion you're having, which is so powerful. But also when we think of this database of where we hold these stories that influence our perception, it's not like, oh yeah, the database is right. It's in the hippocampus. And then like, pardon me, and they let, like, no, we don't know where it is, right? It's in consciousness. Consciousness is not been proven to be in the brain. And if anyone you meet says so, they are not based in evidence. The brain has a lot going on, but our database, it could be in our gut, right? There's a lot of great work looking at the um, amount of neurons in our belly, but consciousness is not something we can just find and then like remove. So the work of building emotion awareness is the work of understanding our biases. The work of really looking at these historically held ideas and beliefs and slowly starting to investigate them kindly and kind of adding in these corrective emotion experiences, right? These new, so let's say I, um, you know, have been really hurt in the past. Like I had my heart broken or I was cheated on. It'd be really hard to get into a new relationship without like, oh man, like that fear, right? And then you have a relationship and it's starting to work out and it's safe and it's good. And you're like, okay, like it could be different. And that becomes a different story that we include, but there's not an easy way to unwind. And then the theory that my dad has, again, a theory, because we can't prove it, is that the triggers and the stuff that's most instantiated in our database, I'm saying here, who knows, database, um, are things that happen early in our life, things that were really intensely emotional and things that happen repeatedly, right? So if you are, you know, always receiving a sense of injustice, right? Um, through the historic and systemic oppression that exists in our society, that's gonna be in your database over and over and over. If you lost a, a relative or loved one early in your life, that's in your database, right? If, you know, so all of these more poignant emotional events and the relationship of emotion and memory, it's very interesting and dynamic and cool, but suffice to say, a lot of what we remember is what we had high emotional experiences around. That's what gets encoded into our memory, right? So easier to remember high intensity emotional events than algebra, for example, or even what happened last Saturday. Pop quiz, anybody? No idea, <laughs> right? <laughs> Hard to remember, but if there was a potent emotional event last Saturday, you probably will remember it. So great questions. Move into anger just a bit more. So, yes. I, I, I was just curious. I just wanted, when you said that about the con consciousness, like we don't know where that lives. And I'm curious is consciousness awareness? Oh, man. I got to bring that question. It's so good. <laughs> the question is, is consciousness awareness? Um, there are like so many more awesomely nerdy people. If that's, if that's a beyond the scope or whatever. But I love it. Long. No, I think, but I want, I just want to invite like an investigation of that. Right. And of our own felt experience of like, what is consciousness and what is awareness? And it really matters in the context of emotion in terms of our theory of like, what are we trying to do? Are we just trying to like suppress what feels bad and enhance what feels good? Or actually, are we trying to be like a bit more free, actually have equanimity and spaciousness around our emotions? And according to some Buddhist texts, like the ways that our emotions are resolved is they naturally unwind in the context of spaciousness. So if we are thinking, I, I often think of awareness as a spaciousness, and I think of consciousness really as the, the space of our awareness. But that's, it's just like, talk about really difficult concepts to describe. I think they're much better felt, you know, so like, what is it you want to feel around this? And, and I like to get really practical around, especially emotions. There's some things that we can really get so nuanced and lost on, but what is the quality of experience we want to have around our emotions? And I would say that spacious awareness or, you know, a sense of greater 
consciousness of all the causes. Well, yeah, it gets a little tricky because consciousness can mean knowing too, right? My awareness of, my knowing of. We'll come back to that. Okay, good, good. <laughs> um, so with anger, just like a little little bit more specificity, um, anger is is not just one emotion. It's a family of emotions. Anybody have any other kind of synonyms for anger? Any other versions of anger? What, what else might be part of this anger family? Yeah. Fear. What else? Rage. Afraid. Frustration. Frustration. Rage. Impatience. Rage. Impatience. Irritation. Irritation. Oh, well, you guys are good at this. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's interesting because anger is an emotion, I would say, in teaching these last 15 years or so, it's the top one that people want to work with because when we enact anger in a way that is destructive, everybody knows. And when we enact fear in a way that's destructive, sometimes like nobody knows, like we're just like in our own little fear hell realm, but no one else is really catching on. But when we are angry and we struggle with anger, then it's like you get a lot of feedback, right? Um, so fear is a related emotion, but it's actually its whole own family that we will do on another subsequent Saturday. But with anger, it is, as folks were mentioning, impatience, annoyance, um, frustration, rage. You know, there's a lot of different states of anger. And even within irritation, you can be like a little irritated or very irritated. And when we think about um, this emotion, it can be expressed in a whole variety of ways. As I mentioned, it could be expressed through passive aggressivity. Right. But it can also be expressed through yelling, banging things around, cursing, for example, at one's printer. Like who would do that? Right. You can just feel <laughs> you can feel like and it's so interesting. Again, the emotion arises so quickly and our response arises so quickly. And often it's very hard for us to bring awareness to our emotion before we respond. So that famous Victor Frankl quote of between stimulus and response, there is a gap. And in that gap lies our freedom is describing the gap between our trigger and our response. 30 seconds, right? <laughs> that's, that's really tough. And often we respond like, you know, swearing at your printer, which, and then we have a moment. So like our primary response might be really fast and maybe not that constructive, and then it's like, all right, what are your other options? Like looking around and finding things to, to help support you in it. And when we think about anger, um, I got to see Ocean Vuong last night. He had a poetry reading. It was unbelievably beautiful. And uh, he's a poet, if, if folks don't know him. Um, and he literally transmits love through his beingness and his poetry. and while meeting very difficult material. And he said that, you know, in his poetry, he never writes a word from anger, even if he feels angry, but he writes with care and that he thinks care is when we can improve on our anger. And I just love that description that we can bring a lot of care to our anger for folks of us who struggle with anger, meaning we respond in ways that we later regret or feel shame about we kind of don't want to deal with our anger at all. We don't want to welcome it. We don't want to appreciate it. We don't want to be tender with it. But I loved his description of when we bring care to our anger, right? Then that allows it to be an improved experience. There's a lot of ways our anger can be constructive. If we think about many of the social justice movements through the history um, of this country and many countries, people are angry. Anger has an energy to it, right? It has a different energy than despair and then fear. There's like a moving up and towards, right? And literally in the, in the physicality of anger, there really is a leaning forward. In a fear, there's leaning back, right? In a sadness, there's a slumping down. And that energy can be used well, but very rarely do we act constructively while we're still angry, while we're in the grip of the emotion. Um, we can use the wisdom of what anger is showing us 
But if we're acting out of our rage, it's usually exhausting and sometimes harmful to others or ourselves, right? Um, <clears throat> there's a whole embodied experience with our emotions and it's different for different emotions. Anybody kind of familiar with, where do you feel anger when you feel anger in your body? Shoulders. Shoulders, chest, face. And what kind of sensations? Tightness, heat, heat, burning fireball, ready to fight. Ready to fight. That's you know, there's actually uh, blood that rushes to our hands, right, to prepare us to fight. But when we're afraid, it goes to our legs, and we're disgusted and contracts. So it's like all this, you know, physicality of this emotion preparing us. Yeah. It's right to <laughs> that's a learned more recent uh not from our evolutionary database but um yeah and it's interesting when we think about uh the emotion especially in the context of our environment of evolutionary adaptiveness right like all of human history existed in such a different way than the last about a thousand years. And even today you have people living in more communal settings where you can't just like rage out at someone and then disappear into the city. Like you, um, your emotions like need to be part of the social um, fabric, right? But they also have an important role in the social fabric. And we look at our primate relatives, they share all of our emotions. And <clears throat> anger is a costly emotion. If you show anger, you might get met with anger, right? And anger, it's kind of universal theme is something being blocked. <clears throat> so with injustice, what's being blocked? Your freedom, right? Your ability to exist as a equal human to other humans. But then you think of something like <clears throat> road rage. It's like a very useless form of anger, but you're really being blocked in your progress. <clears throat> and a lot of what evolutionary psychologists remind us of is our emotions were not designed for the modern time. You know, they're designed for living in um, environments where anger was like the last resort because you were being blocked. And it was, again, very risky, but without it, you might not survive. And their level of feeling we get angry, like we do want to fight. But for most of us, uh, if we're fortunate, fighting is actually not needed and actually quite a, a big problem in our contemporary culture and society if we go around picking fights all the time. So what we're kind of designed to be moving towards is actually not that helpful. But interestingly, if we suppress our emotions entirely, so we feel anger, but we push it down that doesn't actually help us manage the anger. It might temporarily relieve us of the behavior, but at a physiological level, it's actually stronger when we suppress it. Isn't that interesting? So we're suppressing our emotion, but physiologically we feel it stronger. So you've seen these studies where, um, you know, frontline responders like police officers, they will uh, report feeling no emotion. They're suppressing it, but internally, the activation is even higher. Um, so suppression also doesn't work. So really, we have to be developing this awareness, um, and it takes time. You're, I'm, I'm sorry to say you're not going to just leave here today and all of a sudden have emotion awareness. One of the great ways to work with our difficult emotions um, and experiences is through the body and through doing practices where we start to familiarize ourselves with that kind of physiological signature in the body and allow ourselves to let the emotion kind of just unfold. So um, folks who come here on Wednesday nights know I, I love teaching this handshake with emotion practice. I think it's such a powerful practice because it invites us to start to be connected with and familiar with the sensations of emotion in the body without trying to make it okay and without trying to suppress it. What we get to see is the emotion's natural wave rising and falling. And if we aren't thinking about why we're angry, it will just rise and fall. If we continue to think about it, we'll continue to like rise and rise and rise. And so it's giving ourselves a decentering opportunity by just thinking about the sensations. Um, <clears throat> so, cool. What I would love for folks to do is to take a moment and write 
about five sentences or more, but just briefly, an episode of anger that you have felt recently. This could include frustration, annoyance, go for it if you want to go with rage, but just an experience. And remember, an emotion has a trigger experience response. You don't need to follow that timeline just yet, but just write about a recent episode of anger. <clears throat> All right, no novellas about your anger episode. Now I want you to draw your anger episode. I know it's weird. Very few artists probably in the room, but just draw your anger episode. This could be graphic novel style. This could be expressive, anything you want. Just draw your anger episode. <clears throat> As you're finishing up your drawing, what we're going to do next is get into groups of three uh, for folks who want to do that. And you are going to show, so fold over your writing and you're going to show your drawing of anger and you're going to describe what happened, but without using any words related to anger, not using anger, not using frustrated, not using mad. And part of this is to realize, and you'll see, I hope that, we actually have like not a great vocabulary for describing our emotion episodes. Like we use words, but we don't really describe the phenomena, the felt experience. So try to describe it without saying, I felt angry. That's interesting with, with frustration and, and anger is, um, we have many opportunities. I'm curious from folks in this room, how many of your emotion episodes of anger included another person? Okay. How many was just towards yourself? Yeah. We're, those are generally the top two, right? But a lot of our emotions, even when it's with ourselves, um, especially around fear and shame, those can still involve another person in our mind. Right. Like it's it's our emotions are fundamentally relational. They are the ways that we interact with, communicate um, and connect with one another. So it's yeah, it is very humbling. And anger is a really difficult emotion to feel with other people. It's contagious. It's sticky. And anger uniquely has a feature where we can feel a persistent presence of anger and that turns into resentment. Right. That's like an overtime or hatred. So it's not just this one time I'm angry at you and now I'm over it. You know, I'm angry at you. I see your Buddha nature. We're good. Right. It's ongoing, festering resentment. It's one of the least pleasant feelings. And, you know, it's interesting applying compassion to what we feel anger towards. It can feel so far away from what we think is correct what we think is just and we think is right but at some point we really have to ask ourselves the question is feeling anger worth it such a beautiful um i'd say author and activist uh, named sujata baliga some folks might know her she's in the bay area she's done restorative justice work for decades and she describes a story that um, when she first met the Dalai Lama and she was filled with rage and anger, she's a lawyer and wanted to go to law school to prosecute um, perpetrators of sexual violence. She was a victim of sexual violence. And when she met the Dalai Lama, she was just so, so, so angry. And she's like, the anger is killing me. And he said to her, he said many beautiful things to her. Um, you'll, you can find podcasts of her describing this beautiful meeting. But he said, have you been angry long enough? And I love that as an inquiry question for the people and situations we feel resentment for without judgment. Like, have you been angry long enough? Nope, not long enough. Still need more anger. Like, okay. You know, or like, and it asks you like, what's the cost of that anger? Anger means no peace of mind. There's no peace of mind and anger at the same time. Those things cannot coexist, right? And it's just very humbling. And with Sujata, that question really cut through for her. And she changed the course of her life and became a public defender. 
um, and through many years of practice, develop an exceptional ability to have compassion for the people she formerly wanted to prosecute. Right. And that question was one of the tipping points for her. Really, instead of I shouldn't feel angry, you know, just recognizing this anger is killing me. It's just too much. Right. And um, for many of us, there's just like a lot of these little feelings of anger. Can anybody feel the anger in their body right now, just from describing it to one another? So let's do a really brief little check in. And this is one you can do if you have the opportunity immediately after you felt angry. Right when you're feeling angry, it can be a little tough to do because you're so busy feeling righteous <laughs> about the anger often. But just take a moment, you know, we just described something that made us frustrated. And what's so interesting about emotions is our memory of them and the immediate experience of them can feel exactly the same in the body, triggering the same experience. So taking a moment and getting so curious as though you were a cartographer, making a map of the inner landscape of your body and noticing all the peaks and valleys, all the areas of sensations and the qualities of sensation in the body. Maybe there's a tightness around the eyes or a clenching in the jaw. Maybe there's heat or tension. And when we shake hands with our sensations of emotions, we, we meet our emotion sensations just as they are. No agenda. Not trying to make ourselves feel better. Not trying to deny. Just allowing ourselves to meet and be present with the whole map of emotions in our body. Notice if the story of what made you angry wants to reinsert itself and gently release that story or ideas. And come back to the body and notice that the body and its sensations are constantly shifting and changing and feel or imagine as though there was enough space for whatever you are feeling to shift and change or stay. A couple more moments here of continuing to notice and drop your attention and awareness in the body. See if you notice energy and tension coming from the head, settling into the belly, feeling more present in the belly. And as you notice the sensations, see if you can notice with a sense of real kindness, real care, as though you were welcoming these sensations.
I'm taking one more moment to really notice and refresh this view of the map in the body and notice if things have shifted and changed. And gently wiggling our fingers and toes and blinking our eyes back open into our shared space. So I'd, I'd love to hear from folks. Um, how was it to try to describe an episode of anger without using anger words? What was it like to hear others do that? What was it like for yourself? Um, yeah, and if we're in the room, if you don't mind just grabbing the mic towards you. <clears throat> so I found it very difficult to express anger without using the word anger. And then again, talking about the story, I can feel it come back in the body. Yeah. So yes, but hard to do without saying I was angry because of this. Yeah. And and one of the hopes or goals in, in doing this kind of exercise is start using the, the visceral, like the body. Like I felt hot. I felt tense. I felt ready to attack. So instead of just shorthanding, like I felt angry, like really getting descriptive around like, what is that? Like, what's that like? Because a lot of us, we have these words, but they're in some way like unexamined. And as we develop emotion awareness, we want to develop like a greater language and fluency. Is there a hand? No more. Oh, can't tell. Yes. Uh, I, I, I don't know if this was, I was describing what was the stimulus for the anger mm -hmm. rather than, you know, this was the thing that caused the anger. Yeah. And did you and still feel the sensations of it in describing it? Yeah. Yeah. That one actually can be the hardest. Like when we really get into why. Yeah. It can really bring up those feelings. And then withdrawing the picture, it's kind of like, okay, this like I drew a picture of me rolling my eyes. <laughs> Good. And yeah. so it was like the description of like, uh, you know, of what, what my physical kind of response was mm -hmm. to, you know, to the anger and to yeah. the, what they were doing. And I was like, yep. no, you don't run. You know? Yep. I, and I roll is such an interesting um expression it's not considered universal right not like everyone is necessarily always expressing through eye roll of course because of like shared culture through movies and whatnot that is becoming more universal but eye roll is also associated with a very close companion of anger which is contempt and contempt is our feeling of superiority towards others it has a distinct physiology and it's interesting. It's remember I said anger is costly because you could, someone could contempt is a little less costly. So you see among primates, they'll, you know, have the display. They don't do the eye roll. They do the other expression, which is kind of like, we have a former president who's really good at that expression. Right. Like really like me. Um, and it's interesting because, because <laughs> contempt, um, contempt signals superiority, but without kind of signaling conflict. So it's a way with these primates, if you had these younger um, primates who are challenging the leader and instead of the leader getting angry, the leader just like, really? You can go on your way, right? Very different, but I think contempt is actually a very toxic emotion in the way it's expressed um, and our response to it in contemporary culture. Contempt is like the primary emotion of social media, right? It's like, I can't believe they did that, right? Just this judgment and comparison downwards. Yeah, yeah. Steve, uh, we do have a couple of comments uh, or people online who would like to speak. Oh, one moment, and then we'll go online. Yes. Okay. Um, I was just going to say that, well, two things. One is that when people were 
describing their situation, they didn't need to use the word anger because I could enter into the experiences that they described. Mm. And I felt angry, like the anger communicated without the words. Yeah. It was kind of like, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Very, yeah. So, and, and then I just wanted to say that I thought that um, that um, relationship investigator in Washington, Hoffman, I think, talked about contempt as being the major factor in the divorce and breakup of relationships. Yeah. So there's the uh, really costly in terms of um, relationships, maybe yeah. not so otherwise, but in terms yeah. of committed relationships yeah. was the number one indicator. Yeah. Yeah. And I think with the Gottmans, they actually, they combine contempt and disgust um, and disgust, obviously, even more so like it's some, it's that signaling something is toxic and often it's dehumanizing when we feel like disgust towards another being contempt. They're kind of still a human anger. They're really not, like anger, not a problem in not great. It can be a problem in relationships. Right. But we still, we like expect more of the person with contempt. Yeah. We're putting them down. Yeah. Thank you. Since we have a hand online. Yeah. Hi, Eva is Anna. I'm a, oh, hi. Oh dear. Allora, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. My exercise was uh, in my drawing came up uh, uh, a box. I was feeling constricted, like having some kind of uh, uh, constriction and being forced and being closed, you know, in the communication with someone that was not listening. So I was feeling and drawing a box, constricted yeah. and forced. Yeah. Mostly in the communication channel, let's say in the neck <laughs> thank Beautiful. you very yeah. much yeah that's descriptive thanks for joining us from italy <laughs> wonderful thank you very much <laughs> yeah that like oh. feeling of friction in the neck right and like not being able maybe to share your voice um and i really recommend you know i think it's such an amazing practice the handshake to do uh in the midst of the way that we're moving through the world so even, you know, I've, I've described before, it didn't happen today, but sometimes when I'm riding my bike here and there will be like some big obstacle in the street and I can feel the sense of frustration, like something in my way and just like noticing like, oh yeah, that's how it feels. And we can become really exceptional at recognizing this kind of signature. I, I'm really on to fear. Like fear is like this real, like, it's like I have a chin strap on and like a really tight mask on, like, that's how I feel fear. And not only is it helpful, because if we're aware of our sensations and tuning into it, we're no longer endorsing our thoughts as much. So not like why I'm angry. I'm like curious about the sensations. And it also can be kind of like an early alert sim like signal for us. So we might feel these sensations and become aware even before we recognize like, oh, I'm like feeling kind of angry. Like, you know, the, the clenching of the fists is one too, right? That you see for folks. But we can, with the handshake, again, um, you can do handshake as long as needed. It, it can be just a couple minutes and we let it come and go, we might need to hang with that longer. And one thing that Sokni Rinpoche, who um, created that practice describes is we really have to not have an agenda. We can't think I'm doing this to get rid of the emotion. We have to really meet the emotion, be present with the emotion, um, which is very beautiful. So, okay. So I think we're, okay, great. Okay, great. Hi. Hi, my name is Milan. Um, yeah, I realized it was hard to like find a word to that just felt right for the situation I described. And so I kind of resort to being like, yeah, they were like this. And then I was like, this. and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so I feel yeah. like I almost like put myself back in the moment and reenact what happened so I can like accurately express how I felt. And that's kind of what I return to instead of trying to find like the word that describes it, you know? Yeah. And did you feel like, did you feel it as strong kind of when you were enacting it? Yeah. yeah. And I noticed like I was almost about to start crying again because I was like, it just put me back in the space of what happened. So yeah, I don't know if that's good or bad, but. <laughs> How was the handshake with it when we sat with it after? <clears throat> Um, it did help me feel like I, I can just visualize it 
leaving my body especially when you were like just picture the story and it's just the story kind of like I don't know I just picture mm-hmm. it moving away from me versus beautiful okay I'm here that's yeah there. I'm like okay yeah. right now you know wonderful yeah and I think you know I don't love putting people through their difficult emotions again, but I know that you all do that yourself all the time. So I don't feel that bad, you know, cause it's like, but it is like, we think about them and like, we're in it, like we're back in it. And it's so interesting because often we're not even aware that we're back in it, you know? And it's kind of like hanging out here, hanging out here, hanging out here. Then we go to get a cup of coffee and they give us the wrong coffee and we're like, right like it comes out in the wrong ways and so really like again like i said in our opening meditation developing an awareness of where our mind is going that's going to really help with our ability to recognize when we've been hijacked by an emotion you know or we've been hanging out there because sometimes again we're like i'm good i feel compassion i'm fine i'm not angry anymore but we really are Mm -hmm. we can feel it in the body and it's like holding this tension and yeah, I, it's a it's a great transition to compassion. Um, so we did talk about. Um, yeah, I, I want we'll just time for questions to see the transition. Yeah, right. yeah, do it, do it before we transition. <laughs> I remember one, I went to one of your uh, talks. I don't know, maybe six years ago. I wasn't going to talk, it was a series. Yeah. Well, at ATS. I remember one thing you said that always stuck with me. That sometimes you said something that about, I'm curious, like how things are now. Yeah. But you talk about like one time to how, how sometimes we can go from, from sadness to anger because it's easier to be angry. That's right. Yeah. I'm so glad you remember that. Yeah. And so um, it's easy to be, it's feel, it's too hard to feel sad. Something like that. Yeah. It's more it's easy to feel angry. That's right. And um, you know, anger, definitely some people consider it exclusively a secondary emotion, meaning it's an emotion about your emotion, but I think we have straight up anger sometimes. Right. I don't know about you all, but like I sometimes I was not sad about my printer. Right. It's mad. mad. Um, And there's you know, but there is a lot of times in which we do feel hurt. And I I brought that up, you know, two weeks ago when we were starting to work with forgiveness. Right. And we feel conflict with someone. We feel frustrated or angry at them. And often there's like some sadness, like we weren't seen. We weren't appreciated. We weren't held. And we're like, I can't believe they didn't think about that. And they didn't think about me. And But really, like, there is often a sense of, oh, man, I, no one cares. But anger is activating. Anger is empowering, right? And so in our sadness, we can feel a little powerless. So indeed, yeah, thanks for bringing that. Yeah, has not changed. I wish I could say like, oh no, we found a new way. <laughs> and no longer does our sadness lead to anger. You know, also fear, right? You know, when you feel afraid and anxious, um, we don't want, and we look for someone to blame, right? And blame, like anger and blame, like, wow. We really, like anger loves to discharge itself as blame, right? Onto someone, onto something, like, they did this. I'm so mad at them. Um, and it, it, again, it really, it really is when we're not investigating, you know, our, our role and our responsibility often in, in these emotions that that can happen so clearly. Real quickly, um, in just in doing this exercise, what I found myself doing, it wasn't hard for me to avoid the anger words or frustration or anything like that, because I was just talking about what happened, the event. I didn't even really, except for very briefly, talk about how I felt, except to say that I did this (laughs) and he did that and it escalated. You know, but mostly I was talking about just the facts, just what happened. And I sort of, when I look back on that now, it's like this sort of, almost dissociating Mm -hmm. from the event or from my feeling. Yeah. Whereas other people describe the heat and, you know, what happened and rolling the eyes. Yeah. You know, what they did, 
didn't. I didn't do that. It's because you're enlightened. <laughs> it's true, right? I mean, we can, and for some folks, it's easier than others. So not everybody is as good, good. Not everyone can be as quick to suppress as others. Like for some folks, they can really quickly suppress emotions and others, not so much, right? And what you're describing is maybe describing dispassionately, right? Which is not a bad thing necessarily, unless you really feel that you vacated from the body. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I totally vacated, you know, it, you know, it was, it wasn't a big deal, but it was in, it wasn't a big deal in actuality, but it was a big deal in, in the moment. You know? Right. And that, and so I think when we have perspective, like I kind of heard what you were talking about, it's like road rage style, right? Right, right, right. And like in the moments after road rage, we're like, whoa, where, what just happened, right? But after we've had a disagreement with like our family member or our partner, it's not like over, right? It's still like, we're good, but you still are like that, <laughs> you know, like we're still holding on. There's still like, or when we're angry at ourselves, you know, and there's a big story about ourselves that we're carrying. So yes, please. Yeah, and, and to piggyback on that, I, I find it more troubling that this suppression like, and like Robin's always like, it's okay for you to be angry. You know, I'm like, but you know, it, in a clinical role, it's like there's an expectation that you are going right. to be solid and not be dysregulated. Yeah. But it's like, she's like, yeah, we don't feel these things because we're dead inside, you know, but like it's a joke, but you know, that it's almost troubling yeah. how quickly we get to that. Yeah. And is it enlightenment or is it like, mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Please, please, please. Yeah, I actually generally feel like I don't experience my anger enough, like I suppress it. Um, and uh, it was really helpful to me to have the word annoying as an alternative. Yeah, because I was able to uh, recall an episode recently of annoyance and and which I did not express. I felt it. I, I knew it was happening. I didn't. I don't even know how to express annoyance yeah. very well, but what was cool was afterwards with the emotional handshake, I felt it very strongly in my body. Like mm. there was a very strong physical yep. sensation, which I usually, when people say, what does anger feel like? I'm like, I don't know, right. but maybe I do. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. That and again, I cool. think, you know, though our emotions are universal, meaning, you know, it's a, it's a shared experience in the body and um, how we feel the display rules, meaning what we show, when we show it, how we show it is very culturally conditioned. Yeah. So for a lot of us, you know, whether it's our therapeutic role or the family we grew up in, certain people are allowed to be angry, you know, like the mad dad, sorry to be generalized. And then other people are not allowed to be yeah. angry. Right. And so you learn early on through modeling or through what's being shown to you, like not okay to show anger. And then you disconnect and you're like, no, I don't feel angry. But of course, right, you do. And, and I love kind of Noam just speaking to that of it's not like you don't show your anger. So become a rageaholic. Right. It's how do we develop that embodied connection to our feelings of frustration and then shake hands because acting more out of anger is not the goal. Suppressing anger. It, here's the thing about suppression is we're not that good at just suppressing one emotion. Suppression is just yep. this blunt tool. Mm -hmm. So we're keeping out the bad and we're keeping out the good, mm -hmm. yep. right? Mm -hmm. And so how do we reconnect healthily with our sensations of emotion, all of them? And I think handshake is great for that. And, and annoyance is great for that. You know, like little stuff and being like, oh, that's that, you know? So, yeah, I mean, it's so funny because I'm sure some people in the room here are like, y'all got no problem. <laughs> you don't experience anger, like... You're fine, right? Because it's really tough for folks for whom anger expression is what they learned, is how they coped. And it's just as hard to not express anger as it is to not suppress anger. So just really want to normalize, like anger is a tough one. People carry a lot of baggage with shame and regret around anger. And like, it's not your fault. It's yours to work with, but it's not your fault, whether it's suppression or overexpression. So.
Beautiful. Thanks for the questions. So we're going to do um, a bit here. Uh, oh, hey, go ahead. Mm -hmm. One question. Uh, could you quickly? Thank you. Could you quickly define what you're talking about when you say handshake? It's it's something I've seen you or heard you yeah. talk about again and again, and I miss I miss the description. Yeah. Handshake is that practice we did Thank you. of settling into the body and sensing the emotions in the body. So a handshake practice with emotion is when we notice like there's the form body, right? Like I'm hungry, I'm tired, you know, I have a backache, and then there's the subtle body. And the sensations in the subtle body um, are where we can feel emotions. And when we shake hands with them, we're just noticing them and making space. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for asking. All right. So for measurables, I know there's a lot of folks in this in this room who practiced with these just unbelievably beneficial practices. Some people in this room are probably like, they're my favorite. Other people are like, oh man, can we just get back to like mindfulness of breathing, right? Because they invite us to turn towards the heart. Uh, they invite us to meet and work with difficult material. And it's, you know, it's really beautiful. Brahma, Vihara, is what they're also uh, called traditionally is like, Brahma is like this um, sublime, pure, excellent and then Vihara, like it's like our home, our abode, where we feel this like sublime and um, this freedom, honestly, from our difficult emotions and experiences. They're called the four immeasurable practices because ideally we are feeling them not only for ourselves and our loved ones, but we're feeling them without boundary towards everything. There's no boundary to these practices. If I feel kindness and I feel love, or if I feel compassion, I feel it. There's no end. There's no beginning. And that's really inspiring. Um, and it does require a little bit of faith in a way. Like we have to believe that, yes, I am capable of feeling this over and over and over and over and over. And that has to be, again, from personal investigation, one way I like to describe it is uh, I assume people in this room have had their heart broken before, correct? And then loved again, and then had your heart broken, and then loved again. And even if you're in between, like in that heartbroken state, like you kind of know you're going to love again, right? There's that, our ability, like our capacity for love, it, it's not like something elastic that then like, stretches back or that we can truly break we can feel really heartbroken it can be really hard but something natural and whether you want to consider us you know as connected to the divine animal beings where like it's a natural part of our humanity to feel connected and be with others just as um other beings connect with each other and also just at this more um, esoteric level, like there's just, we're just so socially oriented. We are, we are so kind of here for connection with others. There's an interesting tension with what sometimes people believe meditation is for, right? Or the purpose of like, I need to go away from everyone in order to practice to become more free. But actually, when we go away, we're bringing everybody with us. And doing these four measurable practices allows us to practice for everyone without necessarily needing to be in front of them. So sometimes, especially for folks who make us angry on the ongoing, it's really helpful to practice for them, not while we're trying to get through an argument with them, right? To practice for them on our own in meditation, have a little space. And these practices today, we're going to look at um, loving kindness and compassion. And there are actual four immeasurables. And I was talking earlier this week that different traditions put different orders for these practices for a whole variety of reasons. But the way that I learned and that I'll be leading us today is starting with loving kindness. And that's just a simple wish and aspiration for others, not only to be happy, but to know the true causes of happiness. So not temporary relief, but like really know what it is to be happy and feel happy. Um, each of these Brahma Viharas can end up, you know, we can 
understand it through what is its opposite and what is its kind of false approximation. Mm -hmm. So this desire for others to be happy, the opposite of it is like ill will, anger, right? Being angry at someone. Um, but it's like close approximation, meaning something that looks like it, but is not quite it, right? That is um, clinging or over attachment. So this one happens a lot when we think we have loving kindness towards our partner, right? And then we break up and we don't like them anymore. <laughs> that's contingent loving kindness, right? Like that's not our deep, true care for their happiness. It's our care for them if they make us happy. <laughs> so this practice is so revolutionary. It's something we offer without any expectation in return. And often we can practice it for people and they never know, like it's a stealth practice. Compassion is this, you know, I love the traditional description of like the heart quivering in the face of suffering of another being, just the heart quivering and our desire and aspiration that others be free from suffering. Like that's the compassion. Similarly, it's not just free from suffering, but in order to be free from suffering, you have to know the true causes of suffering, right? So if someone is suffering and they are feeling ongoing stress because you know they don't like their apartment i mentioned this earlier and actually it's their relationship to um to their apartment right it's it's them always complaining like there's not enough light or the kitchen's too small and you know they think their suffering is bound up in the apartment but they got rent control they can never leave right it's this feeling of being <clears throat> tightly tucked in and for them to wish this person to be free from suffering is to wish them to no longer identify that there's something wrong. Like, I want them to be free, then that doesn't mean find a new apartment. I want them to be free within their own space. So that true causes. Um, maybe needless to say, like the opposite of compassion is, you know, wishing someone harm, not wishing them to be free from suffering. And a false approximation is being overly emotional, grief. And this one is really tough with compassion. I, you know, when we open ourselves to the suffering of others, it's sad. And we can actually get a little lost in the sadness of it. But being sad is not actually the practice of compassion. We need to have our heart quiver, right? But then we also need to bring forth this beautiful aspiration of a desire for this being to um, be free from suffering. And in some ways, it really requires us to not have an expectation of outcome, like how it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, and really be able to trust that we don't know. We just don't know. Like, we're not sure when this suffering will end. We're not sure how it began. We don't know the context. We have to kind of like step back in a way. Um, empathetic joy or rejoicing is the third of the Brahma Viharas and such a beautiful one. It's where we feel um, a sense of happiness because of the goodness of others. Like we can really like recognize that in others. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's one that can really especially help us with feeling like sadness or overwhelm. And the opposite of empathetic joy is feeling jealousy comparison um and pretending um it's interesting because the the near enemy I've, I've heard two different things one is like pretending that you're happy for someone um and then the other is getting too excited like i'm so happy for them and it like actually is like a little too much um and then equanimity often a practice people struggle with to understand, but it's just this even heartedness, this way that we can feel the rejoicing, the kindness, the compassion, not just for people we like, but for everyone. And not just, you know, and not only do we have a sense like that we can feel that boundless care for all beings, we have that wisdom of recognizing again, as I was describing that we recognize it we don't really know how things are going to go. We don't know if suffering will end or not end. And as much as possible, we try to just have our care totally without expectation of outcome. It's a very powerful practice. Sorry, I have one type question. Oh, sure. I struggle with this practice around trauma. 
obviously, you know, as he's, you know, the person I struggle by the most with feeling, well, uh, most the equanimity. Uh, what, what's your advice about practicing with what would be the most challenging of all the people you'd ever be able to? It sounds like, don't just give up and say, well, gee, I can't feel equanimity for him. I'm just full of shit about this whole thing. Yeah. Or do you say, put off, try until later and be yeah. smaller, you know, less. Yeah. The question was like practicing with like really difficult people. Um, and, and how do we do that? Do we just try to start with people who are easier or just like forget about the difficult ones? Um, there's a lot of different strategies for that. And I do think like imagining like for, for that, for a difficult person um, of that level, really imagining them as a baby, you know, you don't have to like them now. Imagine them as a baby. And we can only imagine what might have happened that leads to these very destructive behaviors and seeing the common humanity, you know, like no matter how this person is going about it, they want to be happy and avoid suffering just like me. So it's less about I'm going to feel I'm going to try to do this thing for them. But like, how are they like me? Right. And, and that, again, you might need to go back to baby to do it. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I noticed it was the opposite of compassion. It's um like it's hatred and anger. And what was what would be the opposite of equanimity? Oh, I didn't say it yet. Good. Um, it's like interestingly also like aversion and negativity, but it's false indirect enemy and enemy that I think you see more often is aloofness. So there's a lot of false equanimity where you're like, I don't care about anything. It's all good. It's all good. good. Premature transcendence, right? <laughs> like, I don't care. <laughs> and that like, that happens a lot in Buddhist practice, unfortunately, like not realizing that like awake is embodied here with others, not like out there away from others. Oh, so, Yeah. So I have a little exercise that I do with myself where someone really significant, someone with a great deal of power in the world is coming up. And I don't know, it could be the Dalai Lama mm -hmm. or it could be my marriage guy. And I have to, oh, and what I have, the, the exercise I do with myself is I have to prepare the same meal <laughs> with the same degree of welcome and excitement, not knowing who is going to show up. Mm. And if it is, uh, you know, that guy, uh, you know what? It's it's going to be an incredible learning experience. Yeah. It's going to be intense. And how do I take advantage of that? Yeah. It's not going to be the warm, loving, you know, experience that I would have if the Dalai Lama showed up. Yeah. But I'm still going to not miss the opportunity that it is. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So let's take a moment and just stand up for folks who've been sitting for a while. Just yeah, stretch all the way up. We're like boot camp here. <laughs> Doing it. Time flies. All right. So we're going to do a, a little practice of, of loving kindness. Um, such a sweet practice. So loving kindness, again, this aspiration for our own and others' happiness and to know the true causes of happiness. And I think it's a really tough question. Like, what are the true causes of our happiness? Anybody? Full belly. A full belly. Pat on lap. Sorry, it's going to go there. Safety. Safety. Beautiful. 
Belongings. Belonging. Connection. Connection. Abundance. Service. Service. Yeah. No one's going jelly donut. Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah. Hmm? Bacon. <laughs> you, can, you can combine those with the dynamo donut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think it's actually something that we don't often give ourselves a lot of time to think about. And I'd like us to take a couple minutes and, and reflect on kind of this four aspects of our own happiness. And the first is like, what does it feel like when I experience genuine happiness? And when I say genuine, I mean, not the happiness that's conditioned by the outside world, not the happiness of striving and grasping, but like that happiness that comes from within contentment, satisfaction. So what does that feel like in the body? What does that feel like in the mind? And then the second question is, what do I need from the world to support that? So even though like I'm saying this comes from within, we have to be honest, we are interdependent. We need things from others. What are those things we need from the world? And the third is, what do I need from myself? What's the transformation? What are the things I need to sustain, keep going? Maybe what are the things I need to let go? And the fourth is, how would I most like to give back to the world? How would I most like to show up? It's not just Buddhist philosophy that being of service is our highest aspiration. If you look at all the research across positive psychology, the number one source of happiness is our ability to show up and be with others altruism, connection, empathy, right? You don't have to necessarily be a frontline provider, um, but how do you want to show up in the world? How do you want to offer yourself? So the four questions, what does it feel like qualitatively to be happy, fulfilled? What do I need from the world in order to feel this way? What do I need from myself? Transformation or continuation? What would I give back to the world? Or how do I want to give back to the world? For some of these, these may already be things that you have, right? You already have these resources or support. You're already giving back. So just kind of a re-emphasis onto that. So let's just take maybe three or four minutes and, and write about that. So as you're finishing writing, in the group of two, we're going to do something a little different. So instead of kind of a conversation, we're going to do a dyad practice. And in dyad practices, you are, it's almost as though you're, you're journaling verbally. So instead of having a conversation and explaining yourself, you keep about 60 or 70% of your attention inward, noticing what you're feeling and thinking um, while, while you're speaking or while you're listening. So if Jimmy's speaking to me, I'm here. I'm not like stone faced, angry at him, but right. I'm just receiving what he's saying, but not like totally me too. I got it. Right. I'm just receiving. And then when we switch and I'm speaking, I'm also not needing to explain and tell everything. I'm just using it as an opportunity to give voice to what I'm feeling. So interesting that when we write, there's a certain level of reflection. When we speak, there's a different level of reflection. When we do a guided practice, a different level of reflection. So we're going to do just five minutes each. And I, for folks here, I will um, ring the bell and let you know when you switch. For folks online, uh, please having one person time so that each person gets five minutes. And in that five minutes, without looking at your journal, what is it like to be, you know, genuinely happy and fulfilled? What do you need from the world, from yourself? And how do you want to manifest? And don't worry about the precision of it. It's, you know, whatever. And I will be honest, it can be really hard to do this practice and imagine what we want. We can really run into worthiness. We can really run into like, how far away we feel from it, you know, or do I deserve to feel this? So just being tender and remembering that, again, we are here as compassionate 
comrades, not fixing each other, right? Just holding space for us to do work and having emotions is, is a good thing. It's not a problem. So letting people in their process. So I'd like folks to find one, it's a little better to do in dyad, um, if we can make that happen. So with just one other person, if this feels like not the right thing for you, no problem, keep journaling. We'll do this for 10 minutes. So find someone, and if you can sit facing them and I will ring the bell for you to start. And as you come back to your regular seat, just falling right into presence with the body and the breath. Again, reconnecting with the sensations in the body noticing what might have shifted and changed. And now we'll use the breath and do just one more turn of this practice. So again, bringing to mind this sense of genuine happiness and fulfillment. Feeling it, sensing it. With our inhale, drawing in this sense of our own genuine happiness and fulfillment. And with the exhale, may I know this happiness here and now and in the future. Twice more, inhaling with this real sense. Exhale, may I find happiness and its causes now and in the future. And one more time on the rhythm of your own breath and with the words that feel supportive for you. Shifting and bringing to mind this sense again, vividly, what do I need from the world? Sensing these experiences and resources, these people and places, and with them vividly alive for us, bringing that through the inhale. And the exhale, may the world show up for me. May I be supported. Inhale, drawing in. Exhale, may the causes and conditions support me to find genuine happiness and well-being. And one more time on the rhythm of your own breath. And it's okay if it feels just like words and it's hard to have the stirring in the heart. Even imagining these words can be great practice for loving kindness. Shifting and imagining what it is we need from ourselves. What's the transformation and shifts? Letting this be a feeling of opportunity, not a to-do list, not something we've done wrong, just helping us see clearly. We're bringing to mind this transformation on the inhale and exhale. May I have the strength to support my own genuine happiness and well being. Inhale, drawing in, exhaling. May I continue to learn and grow. May I support my well-being here and now and in the future. And one more on the rhythm of your own breath. And then shifting and expanding our sphere of care and concern and bringing to mind how we would like to show up in the world towards others. How would we most like to manifest our true genuine happiness through connection to service? Bringing this vividly to mind through our inhale, exhale, may I be of service. May I show up with compassion, kindness, and care. Inhale, imagining, 
exhale, extending this wish of service connection. And on the rhythm of your own breath, one more time. Then just releasing the words and images and resting in this field of kindness, loving kindness. Feeling this body as a body of kindness. Thank you for your practice. Any thoughts or reflections on the writing, the sharing, and then the guided meditation, or any other questions on the loving kindness? And do you mind grabbing the mic? Thanks. Sometimes I have this strange thought, and I'd like to address it, of over-responsibility for the world, world and okay. thinking that somehow loving kindness is a delusion mm -hmm. and that I'm not responsible for everyone and I should, like not blame myself that the world is so mad mad yeah that's my thank you observation. yeah yeah i think it can be um really interesting for us to find our way into how do we have the open heart for the world and really let go of a hope of how it's going to turn out and in some ways, we get collapsed with our loving kindness or our compassion when we seek an outcome, right? And we think it should be a certain way. And this isn't to deny that there are things that legitimately need support in the world. It's not okay to be passive, but we are just never, never knowing when and how and where we're going to be of service. So this week in our class, we were talking about compassion practice and you are doing these practices of the heart almost as like your ongoing exercise of the heart. Because if we aren't doing that ongoing exercise of the heart, we fall into indifference, despair, disconnect. But if we are continually like strengthening the heart with these qualities, when we can be of service, we are ready. It's not that we are always needing to save and fix and help but it helps us recognize and keep that strength of that heart there for ourselves and others so that when it is time for us we are available so i hope that's helpful yes i definitely enjoy this practice because um due to the nature of of my work i'm usually in service towards others and a lot of compassion and um a lot of open hardness because usually people are suffering from pain. Yeah. Um, but it reminded me that I have to have the same open hardness and same compassion towards myself. Mm, <laughs> uh, and a lot of times I, I forget that, but you know, question one and question four is, um, it's a reminder of, mm. I have to apply those same things that I apply towards others towards the South um, in order to continue yeah. to, to be able to do that. But yeah, thank you. And I know you already know that, right? Like conceptually. But we all know it. Right. <laughs> yeah. And just to ask you one more question. Yes. What were, if anything, like, what did you notice in terms of writing versus speaking versus like meditating? Um, For me, um, being uh, more kinesthetic, I feel more, right? So, um, to be honest, I don't enjoy writing. Uh, some people love to write. Yeah. I 
so just listening to Tom and, you know, listening to myself. And actually, this was the first time I, I and not, not the first time, but the first time in a long time that I truly uh, was, you know, present listening. Yeah or truly hearing the individual and hearing myself yeah. versus trying to understand it. Right. right. So it was a very different exercise in that sense. And again, being more kinesthetic, um, it's for me, it's just like, it was surprising uh, when you, when you give those instructions to be like, you know, be listen but like be more aware of what's happening in your own body so that was that was a good, really good exercise wonderful and a lot of times that's what i do when i with my work you know people come in and they speak to me <laughs> yeah. but really what i'm listening for is listening to their bodies yeah. right because a lot of times the body reveals more than what they actually tell me yeah. so yeah thank you so much yeah and it is such a powerful practice to be heard Right. And also to listen, it can be awkward and challenging. And that's interesting, too. So, yeah. Thank you. We're going to move on to sadness. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it was a little ambitious than what we're going to do today. But I think it's nice. And um, we'll give ourselves a little bit of time. We don't need to unpack the definition of emotion, the timeline of emotion. We're just going to talk a little bit about sadness itself. And, um, and compassion. And they are so hand in hand. It's just kind of a little bit like a beautiful way to bring one more aspect of emotion together. So with sadness, just like with anger and all the emotions, there's a whole family of these emotions. It's not just sad. Any other emotion words for sadness folks can think of? Depression. Grief. Grief. Disappointment. Disappointment. Sorrow. Despair. Sorrow. Loneliness. Right? Hopelessness. Disappointment. Disappointment. Yeah. And I think on our lower edge or end, right, is that kind of loneliness, disappointment, and then all the way to like agony, sorrow, and that range of intensity and despair. And what's interesting is, you know, things like grief and depression, especially grief. Grief has many emotions within it. Grief includes guilt, frustration, anxiety, sadness. So it's not that kind of temporary coming and going right, that we feel in sadness. There's also sadness in grief. And same with depression, though there may be acute moments in which we feel that real sorrow with depression, it also can be a lot of what's called blunting of emotion or not feeling, not being connected. Something like 37% of folks in North America feel clinical level of depression or anxiety. It's a very common experience. And what's so interesting is if you try to pull apart those um, clinical disorders, you can. There's so much convergence. So with our depression, there's also an insecurity and anxiety. Like it's just really linked together. And so even though I'm teaching about these emotions separately, they, they connect, right? Just as we were talking about the relationship of anger and sadness, sadness and anxiety. Um, Sadness has such a beautiful role for us. When we feel sad, it is an invitation to seek comfort, right? And to get care and to get support from others. When we think about our environment of evolutionary adaptedness, and my dad, when he was doing some field anthropological work, was in like a, a village where it was a lot like how all of us survived, or our ancestor did for thousands and thousands of years. There was no doors on the huts where he visited in this tribe. You know, and you have this communal um, group of about 80 people like you can't go and hide your sadness. Like It's a part of what people are experiencing together in our contemporary day and age. We can hide our sadness from ourselves through distraction and from others through hiding right? through just not being in our communal spaces with the doors always open. 
And I think we we get we get to miss out in that way on this this beautiful function of sadness, which is to seek comfort. Sadness also helps us recognize what matters to us, have a real sense of what we value, what we care for. It gives us that very kind of visceral sense. And with things like disappointment, sadness can show us, you know, maybe what we need, what we want more of as well. When we think of a, a constructive example of sadness, um, can anybody think of a constructive example or way? Yeah. I've made a recent discovery. I think I'm on to something that when we can be vulnerable, which is kind of a form of sadness, that when I have to expose my sadness, mm -hmm. uh, that other people are actually finding that helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, any emotion, so vulnerability is not unique to sadness because we can be vulnerable with any emotion, but absolutely like when we are expressing and feeling sadness with others, it can help us feel more connected. Right. And, you know, sadness is this emotion of connection or it, it, can, it has a potential. I'd say the destructive form of sadness is when we isolate Right. And when we don't get that support, when we kind of get we miss out on that um, kind of universal evolutionary function of sadness, which is to help us seek comfort. And it's so interesting, you know, even if we see the facial expression of sadness, on like. Like you want to move towards like it's so natural, like we see the facial expression of sadness and there's like, a oh, you know, and yet. Of course, we can mask our facial expressions. They aren't just showing all the time. Like we actually um, are able to mask our facial expressions starting at nine months of age. So it's something we can really do and often do well. But it is like such a great way to help people uh, care for you and show up for you. And um, I don't know about anybody else in the room, but I, I am like really good at not asking for help. Yeah. yeah. Especially if it's sadness, I'm like, no, I'm good. We'll talk about it when I'm over it, right? It's really hard to include people and in our individualistic culture and probably capitalism. Um, it really contributes to this idea that, you know, we got to be happy all the time. We got to be busy. We got to be productive, look good, feel good. And sadness isn't included in that. But I mean, for me personally, um, I love my sadness. That's not everybody's experience, but there's almost a way I could see a destructive sadness of hanging out there too long. I mean, it is so rich, you know, you get into that sense of just the sorrows of the world, the sorrows of your own heart. You kind of want to cocoon, listen to your favorite songs, you know, like get in there. And, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but if that's like where we land, where we operate from can be a problem. I'm so, so, so happy at how many more people are coming forward with depression and sadness, like public figures and um, celebrities and talking about, you know, feelings, not only of sadness, but ongoing depression and this world that we live in. There's always been causes for sadness and, and feeling of despair, but there's a lot of them right now. There's a lot of them being revealed. And so finding the way that we can hold our sadness, just like we can hold our anger, is that relationship in the body, like really feeling and like welcoming and being with. And, you know, with sadness, I do think it's nice to give ourselves that opportunity to listen to those sad songs. You know, it's it's funny because I, um, I find that looking at old photos, I don't know if folks ever do that, I don't realize I'm looking to feel sad when I like go start scrolling through photos and I'm like, Oh, I'm just looking for a reason to feel sad. Mm -hmm. You know, looking at the past and like these memories and people, you don't any, know anymore who are not around anymore. And you know, there's, it's like an, it's a, it's a fundamental human experience and not something we can deny or avoid. And if we do, we're missing out on life. You know, we're cutting ourselves out from a huge part of the human experience. Um, Questions on sadness? Mm -hmm. 
my experience of sadness has really evolved since I was a child. When I was a child, my my world was involved in sadness. My mm -hmm. father died when I was five years old, mm -hmm. and everybody around me was really sad, and I was really sad. But it manifested itself in for me in anger, and I was just this rage kid, kid for years and years and years and years. And then I started seeing the destructive aspect of that anger and started realizing that it really was about sadness and did a lot of work with that and so now decades and decades later sadness is what you were just talking about this really rich sort of experience that can come over me um, for all kinds of different reasons sometimes things happen. Sometimes I see something stupid on television. I can, you know, a commercial of some, you know, some more commercials used to really throw me when they were around. I don't know if they used to mm -hmm. But I like what you said about it. It's the place where you're coming from. It's the place where you land. It's the yeah. place where I live. It's a problem. Yeah. You know, it's not, it can be informative. And and it's you know it's real. Yeah, it's better than being pissed off about shit that's going on in my life. But it's it, I, I I don't like it when it becomes a place I'm coming. Yeah, it was a place I dwell in. Yeah, when it devolves into self pity. Yeah, that's real. Right. Yeah. But. At some point, I want to hear about all that work you did to transform it. But thank you for, for oh, sharing man, it with us. It's like, you know, years of meditation practice, years of 12 step work, yeah. therapy, yeah. and a, a, frankly, a lot of time out in the woods having imaginary conversations with people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's such a, it is such an altered state. You know, especially that acuity of grief when we've we lost someone, you know, it, it has a different flavor than just the disappointment and the loneliness. Right. It's, it's and it is an opportunity to commune with different states of consciousness and to really understand ourselves in a different way. There's something so unbelievably humanizing about our shared grief. Right. And we don't get that many opportunities to share that with one another. And uh, I have experienced that folks who have denied their grief or tried to put away their sadness for too long becomes really intimidating. Like you don't want to go there. It feels like it'll be endless. And yet it's not, you know, it, it isn't. And what I have personally experienced, um, which you see across the Buddhist literature is once you break through that kind of intensity of the sadness maybe that first you know you let yourself actually feel it and it washes over you where you land is a deeper sense of connection with all beings mm -hmm. you know it's, it doesn't actually keep you isolated but that does that requires like a loving holding environment either your own or someone with you that doesn't always happen when you feel you could just cycle through feeling sadder and sadder and overwhelmed. But there is that place where we can feel held and loved. See a question online. Go ahead. Hi there. Hi, Eve. Uh, I just wanted to ask you something. Because um, I've seen that more than once a person something happened in in the sense that the son did something to the mother and everybody that was that heard about it got angry and thought that of course she, she would be angry and then i asked <clears throat> her it's a friend she's a friend of mine i asked her if she got angry with what happened and she said no but i i felt that she was kind of suppressing that yeah. But then I asked, but are you sad about it? And then she said, yes. Mm. So what I noticed is that sadness comes, it's kind of more allowed for a mother to feel to, to the yes. children. Yeah. And in that sense, it's kind of holding the sorrow and, and being hurt and, yeah. and disappointed or whatever. 
I'd like you to comment a little bit more on that. I'm so glad you brought that forward. And, you know, I did mention these display rules, right? What emotions we're allowed to feel. And unfortunately, um, you know, there really are some pretty stark gender differences of who's allowed to feel anger and sadness. And then that also is different in terms of um, ethnicity, right? Who's allowed to feel anger and sadness. And that can be in your family, that can be in your culture, in your country. But for sure, it's, and I've seen some beautiful writing on this a couple of years ago. I can't remember the name of the author, wrote a book about women in anger. And, um, you know, in one interview she was doing about it, she was like, I just kept saying like, I'm so sad. But like, she was so angry, right? But she could only say like, I'm so sad. You know, and um, just how do we learn to actually feel what we're feeling? And, and it could be that we have sadness, but if we have never learned um, an ability to express anger. Yeah. And I and I think that's really true. And, and unfortunately, I think it can be harder for men to express the sadness um, than for women to express anger. I, I hope and feel like that's changing. I see the social emotional learning shifting and changing um, in early education, but yeah, it's definitely true. Thank you. Now we have a, we have a comment uh, from uh, Milan who uh, uplifts the uh, comment that grief is a different flavor of sadness. Hmm. Yeah, grief is a different flavor of sadness. Yeah, and again, within the grief process, we can feel regret. Did I do enough? We can feel angry, like, oh, I can't believe they left. Like, why did they do, they, they did that behavior um, that contributed to their, to their end. So there's definitely um, a lot of feelings in grief, but yeah. Sadness is, is, you know, I remember feeling sadness myself as a very young person. And um, it's interesting, like the older you get, the more reasons possibly that you have to be sad. Okay. Yeah, you can feel it from such an early age. And it's such a uncomfortable feeling. You don't know what to do with it. And if you're lucky, you have a safe person to tell. But if not, it just is... Um, yeah, it's such a, a beautiful and complicated feeling. And I'm just so grateful to poetry and to music and all these ways we can express like the, in some ways, what feels just so hard to put words to, so hard to, to kind of be with. And I feel so, I mean, at Ocean Vuong last night, I don't think there was a dry eye in the audience. He, he writes extensively about trauma and loss and his heart is like through his voice and it was like a collective experience with 1200 other people of grieving and of sadness. Just very powerful. I'm sure it'll be um, online as the audio, at least through city arts and lectures. My folks are interested. He, he did a city arts and lectures right at the beginning, right before the pandemic also. And when I heard that one, I was, I was like, there's no way I'm missing it this time. Um, it's very, very moving to have that collective experience. Can we, can I ask a question before we go on? Sure, if it's a quick one. Quick. Yeah. Uh, it seems like when Jimmy said, I don't like to dwell on sadness, and you've mentioned that a few times, with dwelling in emotion versus letting it go. And it feels like there's a certain point in which the emotion becomes a lens with which you see the world. Now everything's starting to look sad. Things that already been sad. That's right. Sad. Can you just speak to how we call it sadness, but then this prolonged sadness? You know, you keep saying, I, you know, is it okay to feel anger? There's anger, and then there's prolonged, yeah, inappropriately expressed anger. How? But it's the same word, anger. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, where is the point at which we're now looking at the world through the lens of the emotion, and yeah. everything is starting to look like that? Yeah. And how do we play with that? And it's okay to feel it, but it became a lens. Yeah. Yes, it's a great question. I, I think the terminology we're using is a little different, but um, if you look at that timeline, just can kind of be your homework in a way. Um, we see like in a single emotion episode and our goal is to have like a single emotion episode, not the cycling of emotion episodes. Right. And so, um, sadness is a, a little bit different because we might feel sad about, especially a specific person, a cup, you know, for a couple episodes, right? Like I wish it had been different for them. I wish they were here now. I wish I could see them one more time, like the same kind of 
mm. you know, evolving trigger. But with fear and with anger, if we're frustrated at someone, if we're feeling anxious about something coming up, we want to notice it, feel it, but not continue to cycle in it. And often that takes like that break, right? In our after we are out of the grip of the emotion, and that's when we apply our strategy. Noticing the feelings in the body, journaling, taking a walk. I mean, there's so many little micro interventions we can do as we're coming out of our emotion episode. Yes. Good questions. Bullion cube. There's a lot of density. Um, but I will, my hope is to do um, a follow up next month and coming back to the, we will do um, fear and joy. Nice combo. And then we'll do uh, rejoicing and, and equanimity to kind of keep keep these themes going. And with compassion, you know, as I described, it's this like aspiration to relieve suffering. And I do think self-compassion can be a very powerful practice. It can also become subverted to become a little bit self-absorbed when our grief can actually help us connect to everyone. But I think if we can really recognize the common humanity of our grief, focus on that part of self-compassion. So powerful. It gives us a sense of strength and helps us not feel fear around our experience of sadness. So I'm going to invite us without getting too deep into any specific episode to just bring to mind something or some area where we have felt a little sadness or disappointment or loneliness. And again, reconnecting to the body. Inviting that posture of uprightness and vividness, but also that sense of ease and relaxation through the front of the body. And seeing if we notice any sensations in the body associated with sadness. Maybe around the eyes or the chest or the belly. And the very first part of finding compassion for our sadness is to bring awareness to the fact that we have sadness. And bring awareness to the embodied experience. Noticing how it hangs on us. Is it like a cloak? Is it like a sash? How do we feel it or experience this sensations of sadness in the body? And as we bring awareness to sadness, we can bring awareness to the fact that everybody who is here today feels sadness. And everybody who is on this planet feels sadness. It's such a rich part of the tapestry of our human experience. In our sadness, no matter how unique the trigger is to our sadness, we are not alone. Feeling or imagining that beautiful paradox that our own sadness can be harder to hold than the reality of everyone's sadness. There's a strength in that. And if it feels comfortable placing one palm over the heart. And in that gesture of tenderness, considering a word or a phrase that feels compassionate. This might be something a close friend would say to you. This might be a favorite line from a song. This could be, I love you. This will pass. Consider a word or a phrase that feels resonant for you. 
And just gently repeat it silently to yourself, almost like a lullaby. And see if you can feel that quivering of the heart, that sense of care for your own sadness. That sense of real aspiration to be free from this sadness. To feel the comfort of belonging and connection. And on our next breaths, we draw in that feeling of deep care for ourselves. And we exhale, may I be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. Inhaling again and exhaling. May I be free from suffering. May I know peace and ease. And one more time together, inhaling and exhaling. May I be free. And then considering expanding the sphere of our compassion. May I and all beings be free from suffering. So inhaling with that heartfelt aspiration and exhaling. May I be free from suffering and its causes. May all beings be free from suffering and its causes. And letting this be the dedication of our practice, sending out this care, radiating that all beings could know their sadness and that all beings could feel a freedom, comfort and belonging. So wonderful to be here with you all. Um, the Cultivating Emotional Balance has a website that has tons of resources on it. So like other talks and articles and um, you can sign up for our newsletter, which comes out almost never, but sometimes there's some good stuff in there. Um, and yeah, just thank you so much for showing up so fully today. It's been really fun. I haven't taught like this in our new center and I'm very motivated to do so. so thank you. I just want to say that this, this work that, that you do, this process over the years has been absolutely mm. transformative for me. Mm. Such a valuable tool, Thank especially you. the timeline. Timeline's dope. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thank you, Jim.